nice of you all to invite us over for lunch after Sunday service. I just wish all of my sweet, darling little boys could have been here. But at least I have my Pookie Pie Chuck and my <laughs> handsome little trooper here. Oh, you're right, Mama. Right here by my side. Instead of worrying about who is and who ain't here, how's about we start loading up and eating for the game starts? You got that right, Daddy. I ain't missing none of the game this week. Last week, Jillian started the kitchen on fire with her so-called meatloaf. And the, by the time the fire trucks left, it was the fourth quarter. Chuck, you said you weren't going to mention that today. Huh. There weren't no hiding it. Our clothes still smell like meatloaf flambe. That's what that is. I thought I smelled something funny. But I thought it was just the wind blowing in off the rendering plan over there. Nope, just the smell of Jillian's cooking again. Chuck, why did you have to be so mean? Okay, oh, okay. Now we're working against the clock here, so why don't y'all just let me say grace? Let's get it done. Oh Lord, we don't ask for much around here. So I'm hoping we can get some priority handling on this one from you. I know you ain't much into sports, because you never said much about them in the good book. But the New Orleans Saints, they need a lot of help today. And you got a lot of folks down here waiting to see if you're going to leave them out to dry or do one of them miracles you used to be so good at. Old Henry ain't asking a lot. I'm just saying, it'd be nice if you could reach down deep and find a little extra for your saints this week. And then, if there's something I could do in return, of course, you know, I'd be glad to oblige, provided it ain't got nothing to do with Doris's mother. Because you know that is just not negotiable. So, Lord, how's about giving it up for the saints this week, huh, partner? Oh, and uh, uh, thanks for the grub. Amen. Amen. Henry, if you're Man. done with whatever that was, do you think you could find time to pass me the rolls? Oh. You want some potatoes there, Chuck? Oh. Henry, this morning when the preacher was talking and all, you know, and he was talking about how we ought to spend more Sunday afternoons with our family, focusing on our family and all, and not, you know, spend so much time watching the game. What was he talking about? Well, Doris, I'm glad you brought that up. Really? Because that preacher just burnt my britches today. <laughs> I mean, the nerve of that guy. No, thank you. Nerve of that guy to get into everybody's Sunday afternoon business, telling them what they ought to do with their time off and such. Why, that man don't even do no real work. So he couldn't possibly understand what we working people got to have a break from our family and all them other people. Why, if our Sundays was left up to that preacher, We'd all be sitting around yakking all day with no TV on at all. Oh, Henry. So bottom line, Doris, uh -huh. pretty much just ignore all that stuff he said about football somehow being less important uh -huh. than lollygagging with your family. Henry, oh. I'm surprised that you contradicted the preacher on the Sabbath. You being the pillar of the assembly and all. Oh, I know, Mama. I mean, I usually try to wait until Monday to start in on that preacher. <laughs> all his high-handed attitude and everything. But this time, he just went too far. Somebody's got to get him under control before we lose everything that's sacred to what Sunday afternoon 
is all about. I mean, next thing you know, he's going to be telling us we got to invite a bunch of people over. Start having neighbors over, giving them free food and all. And then there'll be so much talking, we won't even know what down it is. See, now I think that it's a great idea to put football on the back burner and actually spend some time socializing with folks. Jillian, I sure wish you to put that meatloaf on the back burner before you burnt down our kitchen. Shut would you quit bringing that up? You are just too much. Oh, you. Oh, Jillian. All this nicey nice of yours is going to ruin everybody else's fun. So, if that's the way you really feel, you ought to just go right on over to the preacher's house and you can yak all, after, all afternoon with them rather than yakking right here. Mama, are you going to let him talk to me like that? You're right, Jillian. Henry, you keep that kind of talking to yourself until Chuck and Jillian ain't around to hear it. <laughs> All right, Mama. But this whole thing is getting out of hand. Oh, Henry. Oh, Henry, don't get your kerchief all twisted up. And pass me those taters. I ain't got Chuck no taters down here. Chuck's got half the taters on his uh. plate. You know, there ain't nothing going to take the place of good old football on Sunday. So stop worrying about it so much. Thanks. Yeah, Henry. Don't be worried about it. There ain't nothing going to take the place of football. Now don't that just take the cake. My own family's turned against me. Don't come belly aching to me when the Saints ain't even on TV anymore because everybody's spending their afternoon yakking all the time. That's right. Henry, the way the things went for the Saints last weekend, I was sitting there wishing I had something else going on anyway. I'd have been better off chit-chatting than whatever that mess was. I guess I'm just a lone ranger on this here mountain. Yep. But I ain't giving up that easy. Nope. They're going to have to tear this TV remote out of my cold, dead hand because I'm in it till the end with the saints and listen to me nobody I mean nobody is going to come into my house and tell me how to spend my Sunday afternoon except me myself and I Pass the taters. Oh, I already got taters. Give me some Henry? of them green things, whatever those are. Henry, I just have one question. You go right ahead and ask, Doris. Why are the Saints your favorite team anyway? Okay. Gotta figure out where the steps are. Okay. So, take a little break from the drama. I'm not quite sure how this is gonna work because I didn't plan to stand up here in pink pants. <laughs> Ideally, this, this, this was gonna be black up here and it was gonna be shining here and I was gonna look like somebody different like myself. So just imagine I did one of these drama things like this, and now I'm, I'm Jeff. You got it? Yep. Pastor Jeff with pink pants on. <laughs> I thought maybe I'd preach this as Henry, but I just didn't know if it would work. I didn't know if I could pull it off. I didn't know if I could stay in character. I didn't know if the message would come out the same. So here you go. I'm just going to share a few thoughts with you. And what I've entitled is family values, but probably more appropriately entitled is godly value. If you've never seen Henry's family, if uh, they're a little flamboyant, they're a little over the top, especially Henry and his brother Chuck. Chuck, this guy right here with the thing on top of his head. 
Um, how many of you have read the Peanuts? Peanuts, uh, on, you know, the little cartoon strip, Charles Schultz, okay? Peanuts has a way of just kind of speaking truth, uh, kind of simply, and uh, I want to start with this little Peanuts. Uh, and you, I don't know if you can read it from there, but I'll read it for you. Uh, Lucy is saying to, uh, to uh, Charlie Brown, yep. She says, maybe I can put it another way. Life, Charlie Brown, is like a deck chair. Like a what, he says? Have you ever been on a cruise ship, she says? Passengers open up these canvas deck chairs so they can sit in the sun. Some people place their chairs facing the rear of the ship so they can see where they've been. Other people face their chairs forward. They want to see where they're going. On the cruise ship of life, Charlie Brown, which way is your deck chair facing? Charlie Brown says, I've never been able to get one unfolded. <laughs> but the question that I want to ask us is the direction that your deck chair faces is, is crucial. On the cruise ship of life, which way is your deck chair opened? And I, and I want to ask it this way. Is it toward God or away from God? And as we talk about a family, and we look at this family up here that kind of takes things over the top and just exaggerated a little bit, um, what kind of values, values that, that, that reflect godly influence? It's nothing, anything new to you to realize that we face some challenges in our culture. Somewhere in recent history, we exchanged uh, traditional values, biblical values, for some adopted form of whatever kind of morality it is, uh, with little to no regard for truth, for God, or for any biblical standards. So as a culture, this influence is felt in the church too. We've adopted values not based on God or scriptures, but on self, selfishness personal happiness, fulfillment, and independence. Personal happiness has become the main goal of our existence. We judge the value of a decision based on what's gonna make me most happy. How many of you have heard that before? What's gonna make you happy? What's gonna make me happy? I base a decision on what's gonna be, make me most happy rather than what is the right thing to do? What is the right thing? Phrases like, I deserve to be happy, or I deserve this or that. I'm not saying that we can't be happy, but we've bought into some lies. The traditional roles for men and women, or husbands and wives, or fathers and mothers are outdated and confining. We don't find uh, absolute morality. We, we're tolerant of all kinds of things. We should be free to make whatever choices we want as long as we're happy. It's really nothing new. You can see this back in the Old Testament. You can just uh, look in Hosea. Hosea preached about the same kind of things about 2,500 years ago, and this is what Hosea said. They, they sow the wind, and they reap the whirlwind. And this is the right time of the year to talk about sowing and harvesting in Iowa as the farmers are just finishing up getting their, their crops in. But a good crop yield... How do you get a good crop yield? First of all, you gotta have good seed. Second of all, it takes good soil. And you gotta have the proper amounts of moisture and sunlight and fertilizer. But one single seed can multiply itself far and above. One seed of corn can produce how many other seeds of corn in a good crop? Hosea's time, Israel had sown its spiritual seed to the wind, and they had invested themselves in activities without substance. Does that sound familiar to us today? Talking about saints playing on football. Why are the saints his favorite team anyway? Seeking self-preservation apart from God, they, bought, they brought about their own destruction. And so tonight, I want to challenge all of us to make sure our deck chair is facing toward God as individuals, and as families. Deuteronomy chapter 11, the command goes out saying, so commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine, God says. Tie them as 
Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so, long as, uh, so that it, as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Be careful to obey all these commands I'm giving you. Show love to the Lord your God by walking in his ways and holding tightly to him. Is that a, a description of your life or your family's life? Because this is a posture of a deck chair faced toward God. Three things that we, that we see here. The first is this. We need to commit our ways to God's word. Commit yourselves to God's word. How many of you can recite the Ten Commandments? See, a few hands. Can we not recite the Ten Commandments? Are we teaching those things to our kids? Is that something that we should just know off the top of our head? This is God's commands to us. No other gods before him. Create no image of another God, no idols. What's an idol? Is it a little wooden thing that, what is it? There's a, a songwriter, a singer named uh, Jimmy Needham, and he uh, has a song called Clear the Stage. And at the bridge of the song, he says, we must not worship something that's not even worth it. Make some space for the one who deserves it. Anything I put before my God is an idol. Anything I want with all my heart is an idol. Anything I can't stop thinking about is an idol. Anything that I give all my love is an idol. God says no idols, no abuse of God's name. We live in an OMG world, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Right? He says, don't take my name in vain. I think we need to have a great respect for the name of God. In our language, in the words that we speak, do these kind of things come out of your mouth? It's the culture that's around us. We've kind of adopted whatever is going on out there. And you say, well, what, is that? what does that mean? I think we find another word. I think we say something else. Let's respect the name of God in all of our language. Work six days and rest one. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. Second Timothy chapter three says, in the last days people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, no murder, no adultery, saying I didn't, never killed anyone. Jesus took it a step further and said, if you have hate in your heart towards someone, it's the same as murder. Don't commit adultery. I haven't done that. Well, if you've lusted after someone in your heart, you've committed adultery. Same principle. No stealing, no lying to your, about your neighbor, no coveting anything uh, your neighbor possesses. These are the Ten Commandments. I think it'd be good for us at least just to be able to quote them. How are we to live by them if we don't even have the Ten Commandments in our heart? We don't find them up in public places. They ought to be in our heart, though. God's word in our heart. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we need to commit ourselves to God's word. We need to teach them to our children. God expect, expects us as parents and as grandparents to teach our kids about his values in every aspect of our lives. They need to be modeled for our kids. We need to teach them, we need to model them. We need to make sure that uh, you, your kids, thanks for being here on a Sunday night to see some people dressed up in goofy clothes. Let's do this for God. Let's be in Sunday school. Not just bring our kids to Sunday school, all of us be in Sunday school. Let's come on Wednesday nights. Let's, let's get plugged in and be part of what God uh, wants from us. Is that we need to teach ourselves and we need to be teaching our children. Our family, we have a, have a far from perfect family. But I can tell you what our family is centered around and focused on is the Lord and this church. 
This church is a part of my kids' lives. This is their, this is their home. This is their family. Um, our life kind of centers around this, and not just because we're pastors. I've told my kids, Jeannie and I have told our kids, you know what, we'd be doing this if, even if we weren't pastors because we're committed to following the Lord. Our lives are centered around this church, and we love it. This is where we give our time. This is where we learn spiritual things together as a family. My kids have been taught. They've grown up here. Uh, but listen, th- this isn't just where they should get that teaching. They should get it at home, too. So when they hear it in Sunday school, they ought to hear it at home. What they s- hear in kids' church, they ought to see modeled at home. And it's just part of the process, but we need to be part of a church. And, um, but, but here's the thing. If you come to church, and then you go home griping and complaining, it's like that guy was doing up there. I'll, I usually wait till Monday to start in on the preacher. But listen, what does that do? You go to church and then you come home complaining about somebody or the pastor or something at church. What are we teaching our kids? Our kids are pretty good at picking up on the inconsistencies in our life. We were talking in our Sunday school class this morning about how we need to be consistent. We need to have integrity. So that if you were able to slice me open, what's on the inside is what's on the outside. You wouldn't be surprised at what's on the inside of me. That's, that's what we need. We need to live lives of integrity. So it's not that we live one way at church and then we live another way at home. We don't live one way at home and then do something else at work. There needs to be that consistency. We need to teach our children. We need to model that for them. Um, our language. If, if we come to church and we act all pious and say, speak spiritual words and then we go home and our language is filled with curse words or gossip, or whatever that might be. We need, to, we need to get wisdom from God, and we need to teach that wisdom to our kids. We need to teach his word and not the propaganda that we're getting from the world. You see, we live in an increasingly godless world. How many of you uh, are, are, are with me there? We see it all around, and we just need to be wise. We need to be watchful. We need to protect our kids. We do. I'm not saying we've got to shelter them from everything, but there's a war for our kids, for their minds. Watch the kind of stuff that's on TV. It's not natural. It's not normal. If we could step ahead in time from when we were their age 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, and see what's on TV, we would be totally shocked, I think. But we've kind of acclimated as the culture has, has drifted. So we need to protect our kids. We need to be careful of what they watch on TV, the music that they listen to, the websites that they go to. And it's okay to say these, thing, these certain things are not allowed in our house. It's your home. It's God's home. There may be some things in our homes that need to go. And I'm not gonna list those for you. I'm gonna let you just listen to the Holy Spirit. Just be open, saying, God, Where are we at as a family? We need to remember that as followers of Christ, we're about people, not stuff. We're about giving, not consuming. We're about serving, not demanding. We need to teach our children. And it says that we ought to write those down. The Jewish people, uh, they're they're good about writing things down. They write down the law. They stick it on their their door frames. They write things on the walls and things like that. I'm not saying that we need to do that, but we need to have God's word before us. It ought to be part of our lives. God said to Joshua, Joshua chapter one, verse seven and eight, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in them. Only then will you be prosperous and succeed in all you do. We need the word of God to be part of our lives. We need to write it down. I want to end with just uh, a few thoughts that I I read from author, teacher, Dennis Rainey. (coughs) He says that sensing a lot of confusion about what family values are, our local newspaper editor made a challenge to send a 45-word statement about your thoughts on family values. 
He said, so one night, his wife Barbara and he asked their kids what they thought about their family values. What are the values of their home, of their family? And they started just coming up with words. And he said, they were popping like premium popcorn. And here was their list, the list that they came up with, their kids. Number one, God. Limited television. Responsibilities, chores, friendship, kindness, respectful, speaking, education, church, encouragement, servanthood, obedience, discipline, sharing, giving, boundaries, commitment, keeping your word, home, prayer, perseverance, doing what you're supposed to do, love, dignity of kids, food and shelter, spending time with each other, resolving conflicts, forgiveness, physical affection, siblings, laughter, having fun together, memorizing verses, wholesome speaking, reading, wise counsel. These are, these are the words that their kids came up with and said, this is our family. How many of you have a list that says, this is our family, this is our values, this is what we hold dear and we hold true? I gotta stand before you admit, you know what? We've got a lot of unwritten rules in our house. How many of you? It would be good for us to take some time as a family and say, this is what's important to us. This is what we hold dear. This is the focus of our home. This is what we're all about. This is what we do. This is why we do it. Why do we not say certain things? Why do we do these things? And just have a plan to say, this is our family. It's about the direction that your chair is facing. We need to make sure that our chairs are facing God. Someone said, you must know for which harbor you're headed if you're to catch the wind to take you there. Don't just sail anywhere. Stay on course. So we'll just end with this. What are your family values? Are your values godly values? What really matters? What do you want to pass on to your children? I'd say this would be a good thing for us to do, whether we're a single person, or it's just two of us in our home, or you've got a home filled with children, little children, or even teenagers, to sit down as a family and say, what is it that we as a family, what is, the, what is our focus? What is our direction? What are we all about? We have a responsibility of raising up children, grandchildren, I'm finding out you don't, you don't stop being a parent when your kids leave the house. Someday I'm going to have grandkids. And I want to be part of their lives too, helping to direct them and being an example for them. We need to be an example for, for each other. Your families, your examples to my kids. I want to thank you for being an awesome church, a church that does love God that does serve, that does a lot of these things, but I think that we have to keep continually take an inventory and say, what's important to us? If, you, if I pulled all of your families, we're all dysfunctional in some way, hopefully not like this. I'm gonna step back into character here and we're gonna see how this whole thing resolves. You know, Henry is a guy that you see sometimes up here and he's Mr. Pious. He's the pillar of the assembly. He knows all the right things to say, but look at how he's acting in his own home. We need to be consistent. We need to be focused. We need to be the people that God wants us to be. Just a minute. on the positive. After all, we have this nice meal here. We're all together as a family. Say, where are Hank and Brooke anyhow? Chuck, didn't you invite him? Well, Mama, I was going to, but then I forgot. Well, Chuck, you live right next door to him. 
Couldn't you have just gone over and invited him in person? Well, I never thought of that, Mama. Piece of work, buddy. Well, ain't anybody gonna answer that door? Hey, the doorbell's ringing. Guess I'll do it. Not even my house. You on that. <laughs> Working on it. See who it is here. <laughs> it's Hank and Brooke. Well, invite me. Well, all right. <laughs> Thanks, Daddy. Well? Seriously? Seriously? You couldn't hey, invite guys. us for Sunday lunch. And look, the bowls are almost empty and there's hardly any roast beef left. Oh, Brock, I'm so sorry. Come sit by me. Chuck was supposed to invite you. Here, I've got some Brussels sprouts left. You can have them. Thanks a lot, Jillian, but that husband of yours, though, he's a beast. Can't you do something about him for once, Jillian? Yeah, where's that shock collar at, anyway? <laughs> now, Hank, you just quit that bad mouth and get over here and give your mama a big Sunday after church kiss. Right here. Yes, Mama. Uh. I love you. <laughs> All right. Hank, look here. This dinner is over. It's time for Saints football. We're all moving on. The game starts in exactly two minutes, which means that you and everybody else here has got to be quiet in exactly one minute and 50 seconds, or else you can just leave these premises. Well, isn't that just nice? We barely get in the door, and look what's happening. Henry's inviting us to leave already. Henry, you can't talk to us like that. Tell him, Daddy. Hank, you now have one minute and 20 seconds before the game starts. So I advise you to sit down before things get ugly. Brooke, we're out of here. Oh, Hank, Brooke, don't leave. Henry don't mean anything by it. Come oh, on. yes, I do. Henry. Hank, you can just take that pampered little princess and take her back where you bought her. Henry. And make it snappy. Because you've got exactly 45 seconds until Chuck here is going to remove you from the premises. If you don't, be quiet. Now you boys just stop this arguing. Hank, before you got here, we were having this nice relaxing meal, getting ready for a little Sunday afternoon football like we always do. It's true. Now, if you boneheads don't control yourself and act civilized, I'm going to put you across my knee. All right, all right, Mama. I have had enough of this. Now, I'm going to take this here remote, and I'm going to turn on that TV, and there better be no more yakking after that. Cleveland had won the game. Now, let's take another look. Watch sight. Total what in tarnation? Daddy, what is going on? It's the Browns playing. Where the Saints is supposed to be on? Do I look like the TV guy? Check another station. The final run, three strokes behind Tom Kite. It's golf for heaven's sakes. Get up, he said. Ah. You know, Henry, I was thinking 
that it was kind of funny that the saints were playing twice in one week. Two times in one week? What are you talking about, Doris? Well, last Thursday night, when you went down to talk to the mayor, because you were unhappy with um, the color of the fire hydrants oh, they yeah. painted Them fire in front of the library. Wrong color. Yep. Well, they hurt well, a piece of my mind, that's for sure about that. Well, well, anyway, Henry, you know me. I was home, flipping the channels, looking for a good cooking show, you know. You know, I love that British woman. Isn't she great? And then that little French guy, he is Doris, so cute. will you please? Anyway, anyway, I was flipping the channels and I couldn't find a cooking show to watch. So, I watched the Saints instead. They were playing on Thursday night football. And they lost. Daddy, could I have another roll? Pastor Jeff said, give an altar call after this. <laughs> Henry messed it up. <laughs> Actually, what a powerful uh, little picture of dysfunction. And sad to say, as a pastor, I've had people come in and talk to me and tell me their problems. And it may not be quite like this, but there have been times that maybe it's been about the same or worse. And... Uh, you know, I, I think that our values sometimes we, we do get to wanting things that are maybe sometimes not just direct sin, but aren't the, aren't the important things. So I want us to pray and let us as a church truly during this holiday season keep the things that really matter that in our family celebrations and Christmas and Thanksgiving. Let's place values on what it's really all about. And uh, while there's nothing wrong with presence, and I don't want to be a Scrooge in any way, keep that all about Jesus. You know, one of the most moving things I ever saw, if you've ever read about St. Nick, I mean, there's some things there, but one of the moving things I ever saw was Santa Claus kneeling down among kids to Jesus and telling them that he's just this person that represents in a human way, but this is what it's all about right here, Jesus, and pointing them and bowing down at the manger, pointing to Jesus Christ. And um, uh, it, it caught me off guard the first time I saw that. And since then, I've kind of seen some, some uh, uh, statues of Santa bowing, uh, in, you know, to the manger, to Jesus. Uh, it's, it's the greatest thing possible that... Jesus would leave heaven and come to a dark, sin-sick world knowing he was going to die and uh, took on humanity for us. And um, so we, we need to keep our values really centered in the Bible. And it really convicted me to think, you know, how many of our kids really know the, the Beatitudes, the Ten Commandments, the fruit of the Spirit, and, and, and down the road, the things they should know uh, about the Word of God and um, very key scriptures that really sink deeper in their hearts and grandchildren. I said the other night or the other day, I said, you know, when we look at the world and the way things are going, we could really have some horrible times ahead of us. And, um, you know, around the world, it's a lot of turmoil, a lot of persecution to Christians, a lot of nations that are, and people that are just, they hate Christians. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. Or we could be in World War III. We could be whatever at any given time. And that's why it's so important that we give our children and our grandchildren iron rods, pillars. To be a pillar means you hold up a building. To hold up the household of God, the faith of God. To put our stakes deep into the ground in our children and grandchildren so that they're so strong that no matter what they live through, because in times past, people have lived through horrible things and it was their faith that got them through. But that type of faith doesn't happen if we teach our children that the values that matter is, is in a nutshell, our, 
our, our enjoyment of life, our pleasure. You bow your head. Jesus, forgive us our sins and our hearts. We love the fellowship, and we know there's nothing wrong with refreshment. But Lord, the balance sometimes so gets so out of whack. I think it's why you taught us to fast, and you said some things don't go out except by fasting and prayer. That we deny the pleasure of the flesh. We deny even the basics of the flesh so that our spirit man can be strong. Lord, may we see how important it is to truly live out what we say, that what matters most on earth is the gospel of Jesus, the truth of God's word, the love of God, that Jesus, you would help us to live that out. And we thank you for it, God. We pray for this church and everyone here that we would value the word of God and your truth and your holiness in the gospel, in our lives and our families, Lord, and that we would communicate it in a clear way. And as a church, communicate our values, what matters, and help us, we pray in Jesus' name.